Australian Equestrian Paralympian Emma Booth's been good enough to join us. Emma, wonderful to join you, mate, in this time of isolation. How are you coping? Oh, look, you know, it is what it is. I think that um, we're all just trying to get through as best we can, but it's definitely a difficult time, that's for sure. You've got a beautiful painting or picture of a thoroughbred or a horse in the background. It, you've always just loved horses? I have, yes, from a very young age. And, uh, you know, my parents weren't horsey, so uh, it was a bit difficult to get into. But uh, at about 11, that's when I started riding, and it's just been passion ever since. I reckon uh, for any dad and mum out there when they hear, hey, mum or dad, can I have a pony? They start thinking, oh, no. A bit yeah, of money, but, exactly. But then the upside is just so amazing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, from when my riding career started, um, it's just been, yeah, a, a huge, huge part of my life ever since and something that I wouldn't wouldn't want to give up for, for anything. Is it true is it that true you're in the really competition for the TV show The Saddle Club? Yes, it is. Yes, that's actually how the, the whole... Uh, journey started i entered a, a competition from the saddle club and the prize was to win a pony for 12 months um and yeah out of about thirty thousand kids that entered i was lucky enough to win so yeah i got a pony for 12 months and everything was paid for and um i think that's when mum and dad really realized that i wasn't the young girl saying oh, i want a pony but i was actually um, extremely passionate and um, that they weren't going to be able to kick the habit anytime soon. What was the name of that pony? Scruffy. Oh. Yeah, little I Scruffy. I love the way you turned your head as soon as you said, oh, <laughs> Scruffy. Yeah. And that moment, uh, you know, from Scruffy onwards, did you think to yourself when you're going to uni, I just want to make a career out of equestrian sport? Um. I actually, when I got back from Germany, from riding overseas, I decided that I wanted to become a vet. Um, so I actually started a new uni course and, and I was um, doing science at Monash. So I was sort of on the, on the path to becoming a vet. That's what I wanted to do, an equine vet, obviously. And uh, yeah, that, that path sort of changed, I guess, in the start of 2013, which is when I had my accident. So um yeah it's all you know it's a, it's a journey but um yeah um, 2013 your life changed forever we know that i don't want to dwell on your on your accident but how important was the horse in the healing of you emotionally it was extremely important and something that i look back on and and think that i wouldn't be where i am today if it wasn't for the horses and for my riding uh after my accident you know uh, my whole life was turned upside down in an instant and, um, you know, it's very easy in that moment to focus on the negative things uh, and the things that you're not going to be able to do anymore. But, you know, the riding was definitely something that gave me hope and it was something that um, I think motivated me to push myself and, and really make something of my new and different life. So it's hard to describe the healing powers of, uh, of animals, of all animals, but particularly horses, which we are concentrating on in this series. Um, I see it through, um, you know, people that are really terminally ill, all the, you know, from, from old all the way down to young and just the way that they connect with horses. Can you describe it? Look, I think it's really something, you know, horses are absolutely incredible animals and I do feel that they have a real sense of a person, you know, and it was really interesting for me to go from being an able-bodied rider to a para rider and noticing the, not the change, but I suppose how the horses respond to my disability. Um, and it's really quite an incredible feeling when you, you know that, they know, you know, something slightly different and, and they just go about it in a way to really take care of you and, and look after you. Um, you know, and sometimes even, you know, when I was looking for my first Paralympic horse and I was trying a few different horses, you know, looking for something to buy, um, I was sitting on all different kinds of horses and it was amazing and a lot of people commented, you know, owners of horses commented on how incredible their horse responded or changed when I got on. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a really powerful connection that you can have with with a horse and um, particularly when you find a special one, uh, it's something you can't compare to anything else. 
And that transition and from an able-bodied rider to a disabled body, you know, as you've just mentioned there, was it always a given that you were going to go back to horses or did you actually think, oh, I might go into another sport? Take us through that emotional journey. Uh, yeah, it wasn't a question for me about whether I was going to be able to ride again. Um, it was just a question of when I would be able to ride again. And, uh, you know, early early on after my accident, it was probably only two weeks after my accident, is when I first started um, Googling and researching about the Paralympics and para equestrian, para dressage. Uh, and, um, yeah, that's when I sort of made myself the dream goal that I was going to go to the Paralympics in Rio. Um, but it probably wasn't until I had my first sit on a horse after the accident that I realised maybe it wasn't actually just a dream goal, but it could actually become a reality. Um, and it was, I think, because of all the amazing support that I had from my friends and family and, you know, all, all the other people that were involved, that that dream did become a reality. And the end result is um, being part of the incredible Olympic movement and Paralympic movement. Um, that comes with hours and hours and hours of preparation. It culminates when you arrive at Rio. Describe the emotions of when you actually get there and then your competition. Look, uh, the experience that I had at Rio was absolutely incredible and it's often very difficult to put into words uh, but I think one of the first things that I would say is that it's definitely an emotional roller coaster um, the different emotions that you feel along the way are so extreme um, and it's really you know you're so excited to be there and you're going to the opening ceremony and there's thousands of people and like it's just the biggest the biggest thing that I've ever experienced in my life. Um, and then, you know, in a couple of days, you have to then refocus and make sure you're ready to do the job that you're there to do. Um, and that was, you know, that was a difficult thing, but uh, an amazing, amazing experience. Probably the best thing about uh, Rio for me was the Paralympic Village and the amazing people that you got to meet along the way, other athletes, the support people that were there. Um, I think that the Paralympic Village is a pretty special place and, you know, I feel quite privileged that I was able to be a part of that and be involved because it's not something that everybody gets to do. Um, and that's something that, yeah, sort of, I think, motivated me to want to be able to go to the next Paralympics and do it all again. Yeah, and, and, yeah, and that fuels the fire for Tokyo big time. And unfortunately, everything, change you you are a tough cookie you will be able to roll with that does that extra year is that a big positive for you no no <laughs> Definitely not. no 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 um yeah you know it's different for everyone i think there are certain athletes that might have been feeling a little bit underprepared and going oh that extra 12 months is going to be um a, a really significant positive thing for them uh for myself the extra 12 months is, isn't what we wanted. It's not what um, I think is going to be the best, uh, you know, preparation for us, um, particularly, you know, at the start of March when everything with corona started to happen or before everything started to happen, Zidane and I felt like exactly where we needed to be mm for how, you know, five, six months out from the games. We were where we needed to be. We were we had the right amount of time. Uh, and now an extra 12 months, Zidane is 18, so he's not getting any younger. Uh, and I think that it was a push, to, you know, to try and get him to Tokyo this, this year and let alone another year. I do think that uh, he he's such a trooper, this horse is, been through so much and he's taken me so many places and he's he's absolutely amazing uh, and I honestly believe that he does have another 12 months and another games in him I think that um, it's not ideal but you know it's something that we just have to push through and and try and keep as positive as possible which is probably the most difficult thing at this point in time with um, the second lockdown starting. Yeah fingers crossed there. You're also working with some off the track thoroughbreds? Yeah, yeah. I've got um, one in particular, Ben, who uh, I got from John McArdle at Red Gum Racing. And, we used to um, know him as Pacquiao Prince? Yes, 
Yeah, for Kai Prince. So he's uh, he's such a sweetheart, and I think he's just adjusted to this new dressage life um, particularly well. He's he's a real character, but he's such a sweetheart. He's he's a, a gentle giant, and uh, I think the journey with him is going to be quite fun. Uh, you know, again, at, at this time, we'd sort of be starting to look to take him out and go to different places and things like that for exposure for him. Um, so the lockdown's kind of putting us a little bit behind from where we'd need to be. But at the same time, it's given me the extra time to just in, enjoy having him, enjoy the process and um, I guess really take the time to establish him on the on the flat work. Um, rather than rushing him through and trying to, you know, get out to competitions when maybe we're underprepared. So, you know, if we look at it in a positive way, it's, yeah. it's been good for him to have that bit of extra time to transition from racehorse to para dressage horse. And if you notice that any time it rains, he looks like he's keen to get out there, it's because he was one of the best wet trackers I've seen. Yeah, well, um, yeah, so my boyfriend, Josh, he works for... Um, John and so when when I got Ben he showed me all his uh, races that he'd won and it's it's pretty cool to watch particularly when you're watching what he was like as a racehorse and what he was doing to then what he's doing now you know they're just so versatile and it's pretty amazing. I tell you we've had we've had a few negatives I think in uh, in particular racing in regards to looking after the horse but what it did is it actually highlighted how important uh, horse welfare is, and we've seen it across all equestrian sports. And I think it's really highlighted, and you're playing a key part of it, making sure that, you know, there's life after racing for these wonderful, wonderful animals. And we're seeing so many different aspects of it. It can only be a good thing, isn't it? A hundred percent. And I think that, uh, you know, having Ben and, and any horses after him, you know, thoroughbreds off the track, it just, it, as I said before, it just proves how versatile they are and how amazing they are at uh, changing from their race life to afterlife. You know, I think that when they're racing, you know, they're, they're athletes and they're, you know, they're fit and healthy and they're, they're looked after, you know, incredibly well. Uh, and then they go to after the life where their work is probably a lot easier. I think they find it quite cruisy and they're then happy to, you know, do whatever it is, you know, whether it be eventing or uh, para dressage, they're, they're happy to kind of be very obliging and and willing. So I think that's a really lovely thing to see if they retire from racing and are able to go into another discipline and, and or even, you know, just being a, a, a pet horse for someone, you know, some of them have got the most amazing attitudes and personalities. Uh, you know, they really are lovely, lovely animals. Stay safe in uh, in lockdown, Em. Everyone's really proud of your great achievements and we know that there's a lot more to come. Great to have a chat to you today. Uh, thank you so much. Mm-hmm.